Okay, so hello, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, so our speaker today is Miriam Garcia. She did her PhD studies at the Johns Hoskins University in the US and got her PhD by the Universidad de La Laguna. After a few years working at the IAC, she came to CAP in 2013 and she just uh, now won her permanent position as a Científico Titular. Her interests are focused on finding, finding and characterizing uh, massive stars on metal pool galaxies, a field in which uh, her team is the lead, thanks to the many observing campaigns they are performing with GTC, VLT, and HST. And she is also actively um, participating on the science case definition for new instrumentation, like uh, WIF, GTC Megara, the World Space Observatory UV. VLT Blue Muse and some others. So today she's going to tell us about uh, massive stars along the history of the universe. So thank you, Miriam, for being our speaker today, and you can start whenever you're ready. Thanks. Well, thanks, Maria, and thanks for the invite to talk about uh, our work on metaphor uh, massive stars. So okay, let me see if I can figure out the mouse. Good. <laughs> so this is going to be the, the outline of the talk. Oh. This is going to be the outline of the talk. I'm going to give a very, very broad introduction of what uh, massive stars are and what's their impact on the astrophysical context. And then uh, I will make some emphasis on why we care about metal poor massive stars. Uh, after this very broad introduction, I will go into the project, summarizing some of the results, and I will end with some prospects for the future. So what are massive stars? Massive stars are stars that are born with more than, uh, sorry, with more than eight solar masses. And uh, I will come to this number a bit later on. And uh, whenever you see this symbol in the, throughout the talk, it means that we are speaking in solar units, okay? They are a very hot. Uh, sources, uh, most of their life, they have effective temperatures of 10,000 to 55,000 Kelvin. In some stages, they are even hotter. And they are also very luminous, uh, sorry. <laughs> Between 10,000 and 1 million times the luminosity of the sun. So because of this very hot temperature and uh, very high luminosity, there are sources or <laughs> there are sources of uh, a very strong ionizing radiation field that is capable of ionizing the hydrogen in the interstellar medium, creating these structures that we know as H2 regions, such as the one we show here. But this also has an impact on regulating the next generation of stars. And that's uh, what I show here. So here we are seeing the pillars, pillars of creation within the Eagle Nebula, and we see some diffuse uh, ionizing radiation field. So that comes from a cluster that I think it's uh, up here. And if you are very close to uh, this cluster of massive stars, you are going to be unable to form stars because stars ionize. And you cannot have a molecular cloud, which is a very essential ingredient of star formation. But if you move inside the, sorry, inside the pillars, all this gas and dust is shielding the gas in the interior and a star formation is actually going on in there. So they act as regulators of the next generation of stars. Massive stars are also sources of mechanical energy. Throughout their lives, they experience outflows of matter that we call radiation-driven winds, which are supersonic, and they have very high velocity, reaching the 3,000 kilometers per second and even more. And of course, massive stars die as supernova. And this is a very violent event uh, with velocity, with involved velocities of 10,000 kilometers per second. And the combined actions of the wind and the supernova explosion can create galactic scales, galactic scale outflows like the ones we see in M82. So uh, we have this term that we call feedback, and it's the, the whole injection and mechanical of ionizing energy of massive stars into the interstellar medium. And you will hear about this term many times throughout the talk. This is a term that summarizes the impact of massive stars in its surroundings. And finally, um, massive stars and their evolution 
in very highly energetic and very disruptive events, supernova explosion and gamma ray burst. And afterwards, there may remain a stellar corpse, and that's going to be a neutron star or a black hole. And of course, black holes now are very popular because uh, uh, all the results of the gravitational wave experiments, uh, probably you know that we are detecting the merging of uh, 37 mass, uh, very massive star, sorry, very massive black holes in their final coalescence uh, to form a new and larger black hole. They emit gravitational waves and that's being detected by LIGO and Virgo. So I wanted to speak very briefly about this uh, eight solar mass number and where it comes from. And to answer this question, we need to understand that stars, uh, we need to understand where the energy that powers the stars in general comes from. And all stars are nuclear reactors and they spend most of the time uh, extracting energy from the fusion of uh, two atoms of hydrogen to form helium. This is a very, very <laughs> simplified um, cartoon of what happens in the interior of a star. But basically uh, what happens is this, the exothermic fusion of hydrogen to form helium. And what makes a difference between massive stars and all other kinds of stars is what happens afterwards. Massive stars are capable, once hydrogen has been exhausted, they are capable of uh, fusing atoms of helium to form uh, heavier ele elements. And in particular, what happens is the triple alpha reaction where three atoms of helium fuse to form a carbon of uh, an atom of carbon and release energy. And then the nuclear reactions continue in the interior of massive stars. Uh, in particular, another atom of helium can fuse with the carbon and for, form oxygen and so on and so on until iron is formed. Why iron? Because iron is the last element of the periodic table that can be formed by fusion in an exothermic nuclear reaction. So at the end of their lives, massive stars have this uh, very particular onion structure with uh, different layers of different chemical composition that reflect the nuclear reactions that power the star during its different evolutionary stages. Then the star explodes and all this material is released into the interstellar medium. And we can actually see that. This is what I show here. It's a supernova remnant, Keishokea uh, A. Uh, it's X-ray imaging and uh, coded with color is the different chemical composition of different parts of the remnant. And this remnant in particular is dominated by uh, uh, ion, uh, emission of magnesium spectral lines, iron and sulfur. So there's a whole brand of astrophysics that studied uh, the origin of the elements of the periodic table from astrophysical phenomena. Not only massive stars produce heavy elements, but all stars. And there are other very energetic events that populate the periodic table. And in this table, the current state of the art of, the, of this uh, branch of astrophysics is summarized in colors. So for instance, if you look at all the elements that are colored in yellow, those are the elements that are produced in uh, massive stars or in their supernova explosion. And we see that massive stars are the main, the main producers of oxygen, phosphorus and sulfur, which are crucial for life as we know it on earth at least, but also some other elements that we know they are very, um, uh, uh, they are very useful at least uh, for the uh, functioning of uh, our own body, like sodium, magnesium, potassium, and, and calcium. So now that we framed massive stars into the astrophysical invent and even astrobiological content, I wanted to talk about uh, why are we so interested in a very metal poor massive star. So in this video, uh, I show very schematically the evolution of the universe from the Big Bang through the Dark Ages, the formation of the first stars, the evolution of the cosmic web, and the formation of galaxies as we know it. And this same information is uh, illustrated here in this cartoon. 
Uh, Jesus, um, could we make it a bit darker? Because I have many dark slides. Please do not fall asleep. <laughs> okay, so we have this cartoon with the evolution of the universe. We have uh, the Big Bang here, and uh, this is uh, the present day from where we are observing the universe. And this is basically the arrow of time. The universe at the very beginning was made mostly of hydrogen and helium. And it was only when the first stars formed that the periodic table was uh, begun to be populated. So we have an evolution of the chemical content of the universe from basically hydrogen and helium at the very beginning uh, uh, to an average chemical composition. <laughs> I know it's very dark now, I'm sorry. <laughs> to an average chemical composition that resembles very much uh, the suns. And <laughs> No, okay, I don't think that's needed. <laughs> no, no creo que haga falta quitar la luz de Jesús. Perfecto, gracias. <laughs> okay, um, uh, so now let's go back to chemical composition of the universe. <laughs> so uh, astrophysicists, we have this thing of uh, putting everything that it's not hydrogen on helium in one term that we call metallicity. I know that's an aberration from a chemist point of view, uh, but it's very simple for us because the universe is made, it's made mainly of uh, hydrogen and helium. And we symbolize that uh, with this letter uh, C. And uh, the evolution of metallicity from zero to uh, roughly the, the solar content, uh, it can be used as a clock in such a way that if we look at a system or a galaxy or an object in a past period of the universe, it's very likely that it's going to be metal poor. And that's why metal poor massive stars are important because uh, massive stars have played very important roles in several stages of the past universe and they are going to have a very low metal content. And the first moment where massive stars were important were the first stars of the universe. Some, um, some simulations, not all of them, tell us that the first stars could have been very massive, with masses like 100 and 1,000 solar masses. That's a lot. <laughs> These stars began the reionization of the universe. Before, in the dark ages, the universe had been very, uh, was made basically of neutral atoms of, of, of hydrogen. Uh, massive stars began to, uh, to reionize the universe and this is the way, uh, and thanks to that, the information can travel now all the way uh, to us. Also, we are registering very energetic events called Kalmai bursts, which are associated to the death of massive stars, if you remember. Uh, and they are so energetic that we can register them from very early epochs of the universe. So if we can establish a firm link between massive stars and gamma bursts, we can use uh, these events to characterize how was star formation in these past periods. There's another landmark in the history of the universe, and that's the peak of the star formation. Uh, if one considers the rate at which uh, stars are formed, it's not constant uh, on average in the universe. It increases up to this point, and then the rate increases. And that happened roughly uh, when the universe was 4 billion years all and corresponds to a metallicity of one tenth solar metallicity. And in this stage, the feedback from massive stars, of course, was very important. And finally, at all cosmic epochs, the uh, spectrum of a star forming galaxy, like the one I show here, is the ultraviolet spectrum of a star forming galaxy is dominated by the spectral features of massive stars, uh, like we see here, this uh, characteristic the signal profiles uh, those come from, from massive stars. So if we want to infer any property of the host galaxy, we need to understand how massive stars form. So if we have in mind, again, this chemical evolution of the universe, if we want to understand how the universe works, if we want to simulate, and if we want to interpret the phenomena that comes from uh, very early times, we need to understand massive stars in metal-poor environments. And if this is not enough interesting for you. 
Uh, there's another reason, and is that we think that metal poor massive stars are the progenitors of the black holes whose mergers we are detecting today with the gravitational wave experiments. Okay, by are uh, metal poor massive stars really so different from what we have here in the Milky Way? And I'm going to spend the next couple of slides uh, convincing you that yes, things can be very different. This is the hertzsprung russell diagram, or HR diagram for sure. And this is one of the most useful and fundamental tools in astrophysics. So here for a given stellar population, it can be a stellar cluster, a galaxy, whatever, you, uh, we plot for each star the effective temperature that uh, decreases to the, increases to the less, sorry. <laughs> and shut down, okay. Uh, Yeah, I need to be very careful not to put the mouse outside the screen. Okay. And luminosity, which increases uh, upwards. And uh, this is a very useful tool. When we see the HR diagram of a population, we know its age. Uh, and uh, in some cases, we can know uh, the metallicity. And it tells us a lot about what's the evolutionary status of each of the stars in the diagram. Uh, in this example that I show here, there are four very distinct loci uh, places. One is the main sequence. This is the most populated part of the HR diagram. Usually it's made of the stars that are burning hydrogen. That is, remember, fusing hydrogen atoms to form helium. And that's where uh, all stars in general spend most of their lives. And then we have post uh, hydrogen burning stages. Uh, like the giants at the very top of the HR diagram, the most luminous star, which are super giants. And finally, the corpses, uh, uh, which, which are the white dwarfs. And we in the regime of massive stars, we move all the way up here. This is a region that other population don't pay my atten much attention to because it's usually very scarcely populated. Within a population, you form many more solar type of stars and massive stars. Okay, so this is a cartoon, a simplified vision, and uh, let's see what happens in reality. This is an HR diagram that now focuses on massive stars. So what we show here, all these complicated uh, lines, it's actually what happens, uh, sorry, in this, uh, in this uh, blue rectangle. And, uh, now uh, this comes with theoretical models. These lines are called evolutionary tracks and tell us uh, what is the temperature and the luminosity of a given star throughout its life. So for instance, if uh, you follow the green line, I'm not going to do it <laughs> because it's super hard. Um, and you see that the star uh, is born here in all this stage, it fuses hydrogen and then evolves uh, to cooler temperatures and dies in this region of the HR diagram. And we have the same for, uh, in this plot, we show the same for stars from 12 uh, solar masses all the way to 120 solar masses. But this is theory. In the observations, what we know is that uh, uh, massive stars uh, can be classified within different types. So the main sequence, it's the, the easiest one. And uh, uh, massive stars, while well, they are burning hydrogen, uh, they are very characteristic if we take an spectrum and let me tell you now that an spectrum is the only way to characterize uh, massive stars and to know for sure that a massive star is actually a massive star uh, their spectrum show lines of hydrogen and helium then uh, they evolve a little bit and become orbitide supergiants and uh, then they evolve to cooler temperatures and become uh, red supergiants, which are uh, 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 cooler objects with very large uh, radios, radii. They can reach, uh, they can exceed by far the 100 solar radii. So that's if the star is not very massive. If it's very massive, instead of evolving to cooler temperatures, it, it stays in the region of uh, high effective temperatures and becomes a world project, which is a very luminous, very hot, very extreme star with very extreme winds. And 
depending on the mass, we don't know very well which stars undergo this luminous blue variable phase, which is not so hot, but it's very luminous. Actually, the star is uh, on the verge of uh, disrupted, of being disrupted due to radiation pressure. They also experience very strong wind, but they also experience mass ejection for which we don't know uh, what, what is the, the, the source of the power. And they can form uh, these structures like the one we see in the, in the Carolina Nebula. So this is what happens in life. Then we know they explode a supernova explosion. They can explode in all these stages. And uh, that's basically it. Of course, theory predicts a link between the main sequence stage and the end as evolution. But uh, every now and then, we get new evidence that uh, uh, make us rethink these evolutionary, evolutionary links again. So for us at the moment, this is a bit confusing. But this is all for solar metallicity. <laughs> what happens when we include the, the role of metallicity? And that's what I show here. This is another HR diagram uh, with temperature increasing to the left, luminosity increasing upwards. And now the diagram shows the evolution uh, of three stars with 60 solar masses at birth, but different mental content, one similar to, uh, to the sun's solar chemical composition, another one 0.2 and another one and the other one, uh, uh, sorry, 0.4 and the other one 0.2. And we see that the tracks are different. Now, if you remember, I said that uh, luminosity of temperature determines the feedback of massive stars into the interstellar medium. So these differences are not trivial. It means that uh, feedback into the ISM is going to change. And why is that? This is because of the action of uh, radiation driven wind. Uh, remember, I talked about this at the beginning of the talk. Massive stars are extraordinary sources of ultraviolet radiation, and those atoms are absorbed sorry those photons are absorbed by atoms in the atmosphere which is represented by these uh, red, uh, orange things and that transfer momentum and energy and this way uh, an outflow of matter is uh, initiated and the mass lost to radiation driven winds is important enough as to change the temperature and the density at the core and that changes the rate of the nuclear reaction so uh, uh, to take home messages from here, first one is that uh, the evolution of massive stars with different metallicity can be very different because of the action of radiation driven winds and uh, radiation driven winds need to be characterized so that we understand the evolution of massive stars. And of course, uh, this has an impact on how the star ends. So we go back to the 60 solar max uh, example at the end of, of its evolution, the star will have shed two thirds of its initial mass. That's a lot. The same star uh, with uh, 0.2 solar metallicity will only lose 20 solar masses. And of course, this has an impact on the kind of supernova explosion and also whether the remnant is going to be a neutron star or a black hole. But to make things even more difficult, uh, there might be special mechanisms of evolution at very low metallicity. And that's what I show here. This is again an HR diagram with evolutionary tracks. But now uh, we are going to focus on this, re sorry, <laughs> in, on this region. If a massive star with very metal pore content is born with very high rotational velocity, it can enter this uh, chemically homogeneous evolution channel. It means that it will never evolve to cooler temperatures in the HR diagram. It will always stay hot, again, with impact on the feedback on the interstellar medium. And if it's massive enough, it can enter this uh, special channel of transparent wind ultraviolet intense star, uh, which multiplies uh, the production of photons of uh, capable of ionizing not only hydrogen, but also uh, helium too. Now, this scenario has become very popular for several, several reasons. I'm not going to enter all of them, but I wanted to mention that that's one of the proposed channels uh, to form the progenitors of the 30 solar mass black holes that again, we are detecting with the gravitational wave experiments. But there's a catch to this. 
And it's that not all the models of uh, evolution predict these cha predict, predict this channels. And uh, of course, we have not found an example uh, yet uh, from the observational point of view. Okay, so we go back to the cartoon of the evolution of the universe and uh, um, let's see what was the current status before uh, we began working on this. And basically all we knew came from these two galaxies, the small Magellanic cloud and the large Magellanic cloud with uh, one fifth solar metallicity and two fifth solar metallicity. Uh, there's a reason for that. The galaxies are basically in the backyard of the Milky Way. Actually, sometimes it's easier to study massive stars there than in the Milky Way. And uh, there are many studies. We, there's uh, a sample of almost 2000 stars there. And the situation is going to improve uh, with new massive spectrographs and spectroscopic uh, programs such as for most. But uh, these stars are not representative to what happens at early epochs of the universe. And this is where our project kicks in. So our goal is to study stars in nearby environments that for whatever reason uh, are metal efficient. Uh, and, and, and we want to, to look for environments that can be used to study uh, these processes that happened in the first four billion years of the universe. Where do we find such environments? Well, in the local group. In the local group, uh, there are a number of dwarf irregular galaxies that are very metal poor. poor. So this is a map of the local group. This is the Milky Way. We are here. And uh, uh, this is the, the large and the small magnetic cloud. You see that they are uh, very near the Milky Way. And if we want to study systems that have a poorer metal content than these galaxies, we need to go to the Sagittarius Dwarf Irregular, Leo A, Sextans A, Sextans B, and so on, which are very far from the Milky Way. And that's the reason why this field hadn't been explored before, because the Magellanic Cloud set at the moment at our frontier of metallicity and distance. So this is another cartoon of the evolution of the universe uh, from very shortly after the Big Bang until the present day. And what we want to do, sorry, and we have two landmark galaxies, again, the small Magellanic Cloud. There's another one called one 18 but that one is very far away and we cannot resolve individual stars over there. And what we want to do is to fill this uh, metallicity ladder. Ah, sorry. Ah. We want to uh, fill this metallicity ladder uh, with massive stars of decreasing uh, metal content. We began working on this galaxy, IC 1613, that seemed to have one seven solar metallicity. Uh, I will explain in a little bit why we stopped working there. And we are exploring other systems like, uh, well, there were some uh, massive stars known there before, uh, not many of them. Uh, but we stopped working on that galaxy and uh, we began exploring other systems. At the moment, our uh, pet galaxy is uh, Sextans A, uh, which is one megaparsec away with one tenth solar metallicity. Uh, when we began working on this, there were no massive stars known in here. Uh, this, star is, this galaxy is very promising and uh, basically we are devoting all our observational arsenal <laughs> on this galaxy. But we are exploring other systems like uh, Leo A galaxy, which is uh, with a metal content of 5% solar and uh, it's a bit closer, so observations are easier, and the Sagittarius dwarf irregular. And we are also exploring, and, and in these galaxies, there are 10 B supergiants known in Leo A and no galaxy, no, sorry, 10 B supergiants known in Leo A and no massive star confirmed in the Sagittarius dwarf irregular. And finally, we are we also became involved in working on, on Leo P, which is a galaxy that it was very recently discovered. It's very metal poor with 3% solar and it's much closer than one to 18. So again, uh, a very promising galaxy. Sorry. Uh, this is just a summary of how we usually work. We work on three stages. Uh, first, uh, we need to make a census of uh, where the massive stars are within our galaxy. Remember that we need a spectroscopy to know for sure 
and a massive star is a massive star. So ideally, we would like to cover the whole galaxy. The good news is that we don't need very good spectral quality because we only need to detect lights of hydrogen and helium. And then once we know where the massive stars are, we obtain better resolution spectra to uh, analyze the, the spectra with our stellar atmosphere models. And to do that, usually we use uh, multi-object spectroscopy. We've been using the Telmeter uh, Grand Telescope of Canarias a lot uh, because it's a more efficient use of telescope time. And then uh, for a subs subset of the stars, we obtain ultraviolet spectroscopy uh, to study the, the winds because uh, the winds of these stars are so weak that we only have uh, signatures of the wind in the ultraviolet. And this is the situation at the moment. Uh, we duplicated the number of massive stars known in AC 1613, and, uh, but uh, the galaxy where we are working uh, most intensively is Sextance. Uh, here we, we have published already the first catalogs of massive stars, but uh, now with uh, our grad student, Marta Lorenzo, we are working on our latest observing campaign, and we are about to publish a, a catalog of 150 sources. This is going to be very interesting. We, we want to make <clears throat> six and say the new standard for the metal poor uh, universe. And I think we are on the good, on the good track. And <clears throat> we are also working on Leo A. Uh, Iris Bermejo is uh, doing her uh, master thesis on this galaxy and also in the Sagittarius Dwarf Irregular, where we have uh, Irene Forcada, who just began also her master thesis on this galaxy. And uh, finally, we also got observations in, in LEOP, although the galaxy is a bit far away, and I don't think uh, we will be able to do much more than uh, our first publication of the, of the catalog of Obitripe stars. Now some more specific results. Uh, the first one is that we realized that some galaxies are not as metal poor as we thought, and that happened only after we had obtained ultraviolet spectroscopy with Hubble Space Telescope. So uh, this uh, diagram shows uh, the ultraviolet spectra of very similar stars in different galaxies, IC 1613, the small Magellanic cloud, the large Magellanic cloud, and the Milky Way. And this is supposed to be a metal, uh, sequence of increasing metallicity. But now uh, I want you to look at this area. You see that it's uh, bumpy. Uh, that's not a problem with the data. That's uh, caused by numerous uh, absorption lines of iron and nickel. Uh, uh, there are so numerous that eat the continue and give it this bumpy shape. And if you compare the spectrum of the SMC star and the IC 1613 star, you see that this spectrum is more bumpy than the star in the SMC. And what this is telling us is that IC 1613 is actually not metal poor. So uh, we had to move on and start working on, and that's why we moved on and start working on, on other galaxies and in particular in sextancy. The other result I wanted to highlight is uh, uh, we have found that internal reddening is uh, significant within these galaxies. So this is a color magnitude diagram. This is uh, what we have when we do not know the stellar parameters of the stars and we cannot build the hertzsprung russell diagram. But this is equivalent. In this diagram, temperature increases to the left and luminosity increases upwards. But since uh, this is from photometry, we are basically representing here what we see. There is uh, no correction of what happens between us and the star. And what happens between us and the stars is internal extinction. Gas and dust in the line of sight uh, between us and a star uh, absorbs uh, the energy and absorbs the energy more efficiently in the blue wavelengths. So this makes, that, uh, this makes the star look less luminous. So they go down and cooler, they move to the right. Now, here I'm showing the color magnitude diagram with uh, of uh, the whole galaxy sextancy, and that's the gray dots. But remember that I said that we have a spectra for, for 150 stars in this galaxy, and that's what's codified, that's coded in color, sorry. And massive stars, and, and sorry, and all these stars uh, with a color associated means that they are uh, massive stars, uh, OB type stars. 
and they should be uh, all concentrated here, but they are all dispersed along the diagram, and that's because of the effect of extinction. And we have uh, these guys here, which are examples the, of, uh, of, the ex of extreme reddening within the galaxy. Now, because we know the spectral types, we can apply a Taylor reddening correction. And this is what the diagram looks after the reddening correction. We see uh, that the stars are here, more concentrated in the youngest part of the, of the evolutionary tracks. But very interestingly, we have some stars that are uh, hotter than all the evolutionary models. So obviously these are our candidates for stars that are chemically that are evolving in the chemically homogeneously evolutionary panel. Uh, panel, no, channel. So what's actually the impact of, of this uh, uh, in a broader context, context? What this means is that we may be underestimating the number of massive stars that galaxy host. And that's what it's shown here in this histogram. Uh, we show the numbers, uh, we determine uh, stellar masses from photometry uh, with, uh, without and with the reddening correction. And if no reddening correction, sorry, uh, had been applied, we would have uh, returned uh, stellar masses between 5 and 25 uh, solar masses, which is rather low. But once we have applied reddening correction, uh, we recover stars of up to, up to 50 solar masses. Okay, so I go back to the HR diagram, and uh, this is the HR diagram of Sextant A. The 150 stars that we have found are not here because we are still working on determining the stellar parameters for these stars. And uh, what we see here is that, okay, we have, sorry. Uh, we have some OB type stars, we have red supergiants, but there is no way to establish a connection through evolution between one point or another. We need more points, so we still need to keep working on this. But I wanted to highlight two things. The first one is that we have not found any solid signature of chemically homogeneous evolution panel. There is no star over here. We have candidates, but they have not been confirmed. And the other point is that uh, we have not found any star that is more massive than 60 solar masses. And this is, not, this is something that happens not only in sextant A, but also in a 1613 and the small magnetic cloud, which have been more heavily studied. And what is the impact of this? So if you recall <laughs> some slides ago, I said that uh, the very uh, first stars of the universe could have been very massive. And that is so uh, because of the absence of metal. Metals act as coolants of gas, uh, and that makes the, the, uh, the, uh, the masses of the cloud where stars from to be larger or smaller. So uh, less metals, more massive stars. And in fact, the most massive stars we know in the universe today are in a metal-poor environment, the large Magellanic cloud, which are at the heart of the tarantula uh, nebula. And they were coined monster stars because the first estimates were something like 450 solar masses. Uh, this number has been revised downwards. Thankfully, here at CAF, we are working to keep putting this value down. But let's say that this star have like 200 and 250 solar masses. In IC1613 and Sextance, there are environments that could be analogs to, to this uh, tarantula nebula. But in these galaxies, we are finding this uh, upper limit of 60 solar masses. So uh, this is something to worry a little bit about. Not totally, because uh, the, sens the census is not complete. We are working on this. But uh, if uh, we cannot establish that, that the maximum stellar mass that can be formed increases with decreased metallicity, we could be in danger for the simulation of the formation of the first stars of the universe. So we are not finding very massive stars in the sites where we would expect them, but the contrary is also happening to us. We are finding massive stars in the outskirts of the galaxy, 
in a region where uh, that is basically at the limit of the gas density that is considered to be the minimum for star formation. So that's uh, one very puzzling thing about these stars, these four stars that we found in the outskirts of Sextant A. But uh, the other puzzling thing is that puzzling thing is that they seem to be isolated, and usually massive stars form in clusters and not be associations. But these are in the middle of nowhere without uh, a stellar population uh, and uh, 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 linked to them at least not a stellar population that we have been able to detect at the moment. So maybe this is telling us something about how massive stars form in low density metal poor environments. Is this the first time that something like this is found? I'm not sure. So there's, there was this huge uh, mission uh, driven by a, a space observatory called GALEX, which basically mapped a, a, a huge fraction of the sky in ultraviolet, studying the star formation in several environments. And then found a very special kind of galaxy that they named um, Extended UVDS Galaxy, for which uh, they detected ultraviolet emission, ultraviolet emission and that's uh, a signature of star formation way in the outskirts of the galaxy. So perhaps uh, with these uh, massive stars here, we have confirmed with the spectroscopy what uh, Gal Galax detected in faraway galaxies uh, some years ago. And the other interesting thing about these stars is that uh, gamma ray burst and superluminous supernovae associated with the death of massive stars uh, are uh, prefer seem to prefer uh, the outskirts of uh, metal poor dwarf galaxies. So perhaps here we have uh, the progenitors of some very energetic events. I'm going to skip this one because we are running out of time. And uh, uh, let's see where we stand. So I go back to the HR diagram of Sextant C, very scarcely populated. With this, we are not going to be able to draw the evolutionary pathways of massive stars. And what do we want? We want something like this. We want this diagram to be very uh, densely populated, uh, down to at least, sorry, uh, 15 solar masses. And that means uh, reaching down to magnitudes of uh, uh, 22 or something like that. And for the brightest objects, we want to be able to obtain a spectra of decent quality so we can obtain the stellar parameters. And this is our wish list, but then uh, there comes reality. <laughs> so these are optical spectra of very similar stars located in the Milky Way, the Large Magellanic Cloud, IC 1613 and Sextant A. This is a sequence of increasing distance. And you see how a spectral quality uh, uh, becomes broader, and that's because the galaxies are very far away and observations are harder. And actually this is a, a good spectrum a good spectrum, but uh, actually we are hitting the, the limits of current observational capabilities. Uh, we need larger telescopes with more sensitive instrumentation. And the same thing happens when we go to the ultraviolet, uh, which is what we need to study the, the winds of massive stars. At the moment, uh, from, uh, there's a, from uh, the census that have been published, there's a list of nine stars in Sextant C that can be observed with the Hubble Space Telescope, two in LEO A and none in SACDIC. Uh, um, these are the galaxies that we are working on. And uh, of course, all our work is going to be crucial to locate new candidates that can be observed in ultraviolet to understand how the winds of these kind of stars work. Uh, but HST uh, is, is already a very long lived mission. We don't know how many more years it has ahead of it. Uh, so it's crucial that we do this work as fast as possible. There may be some help from the World Space Observatory to ultraviolet whenever it's launched. But the fact is that uh, their mirror size is not too big. And we are going to have probably um, a problem of uh, a sensitivity limit because of extinction once more. So with this pessimistic uh, message, I. <laughs> I start uh, the last section of the of the talk, and uh, where a message of hope uh, comes. And uh, because we are hitting the, the limits of current instrumentation, 
we are involved with new instruments and with new missions. And I wanted to highlight uh, a couple of uh, uh, some instruments uh, where we have been involved. And the first one is uh, Blue Muse. Blue Muse is an, an integral field spectrograph with a very wide uh, field of view that works on the optical range. What does it mean? So it means that within, let's see if I can do this. <laughs> within the field of view of the instrument, which is this uh, green uh, square, we can obtain a spectra for all the stars that lie within there. So this is great because we can uh, cover wide fractions of the galaxies we are working on and also uh, our searches for massive stars don't need to be targeted uh, uh, so this way we avoid missing some stars because of extinction remember all, all those massive stars that were not lying in the color magnitude diagram where they should be because of extinction but uh, this spectral app is going to be mounted on the very very large telescope and we are going to have uh, a sensitivity limit why what do we need to reach fainter stars to reach fainter stars we need a larger telescope and luckily for us uh, uh, the european extremely large telescope is uh, under construction it's a, a telescope that has a, a 39 meter uh, diameter uh, to give you a feeling the largest telescope that we have right now it's the grand telescope of the canarias with uh, with 10 meter uh, diameter uh, there's a new whole generation of large telescopes being built and uh, the ELT is one of them and uh, we are very lucky because with the first line instrumentation we will be able to hunt for very massive stars in uh, the galaxy sextancy and in particular we will use another integral field unit uh, spectrograph in this case harmony it's very different than philosophy the field of view is very small but the special res spatial resolution is exquisite. And with that, we will be able to break down the densest part of uh, these star forming galaxies, obtain their spectra, and see if uh, monster stars actually live there or not. And again, we are very lucky because uh, CAP is very deeply involved uh, with the development of Harmony. And uh, we will be able to do this uh, in collaboration with, uh, with the Harmony team here at CAP. But like I said, the field of view, sorry, the field of view, bien. the field of view is very small and uh, it's going to, well, basically impossible to cover the whole galaxy with harmony and to observe uh, the broader, the, the galaxies uh, at large, we will be, we will need to wait for the second generation instrumentation. And that's Mosaic. Mosaic is a multi-object spectrograph uh, also working on the optical range and it's capable of observing 200 objects at a time. The field of view is very large, so we can accommodate very easily our galaxies, Extanse, uh, Leo A and of course, uh, Sagdig. And together with a huge collecting power of a 40 meter telescope, we will be able to reach uh, finally uh, the main sequence of, of massive stars in these galaxies. So, this is for the optical range to obtain effective temperatures, luminosities, gravities, and masses. But if we want to study the wind, we need ultraviolet and the coverage of. Oh my God, I'm so sorry <laughs> for this. And the ultraviolet spectroscopy needs to be made from a space. And that's why we have been very uh, strongly in support of the construction of this mission called Luboil, which uh, was uh, planned as a 15 meter telescope working in space in the ultraviolet, optical and infrared ranges. It was a huge uh, technolog technological challenge uh, only to send this into space. You needed to wrap the mirror <laughs> into the rocket, so very difficult. But uh, uh, we were very excited about this because it was going to be uh, able to obtain ultraviolet spectroscopy up to 20 megaparsecs in the galaxy once we get in. So very excited about that. Uh, uh, we participated in the definition of one of the instruments, which was called LUMOS. 
and we sent a one pa a white paper uh, to the to the surveys from the uh, to the Astro 2020 survey of the National Academy of Science of the U.S. and also to the Voyage 2015 um, survey of the European Space Agency, supporting the European participation uh, on this mission. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, the results from the decadal survey of the US were out and uh, there were good news and bad news. The good news is that the construction of, uh, sorry, the construction, yeah, of a large telescope in space uh, working on the ultraviolet, the optical, and the infrared uh, was considered one of the top uh, priorities. Uh, 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 and such a telescope would be launched in the early 2040s and would enter a maturation program, like basically now. So this is amazing news. Uh, but uh, the bad news is that they decreased the, um, the proposed diameter size from 15 meter to six meter. So uh, uh, the program, it's not going to be as ambitious, although it's great to have this continuity of uh, ultraviolet coverage from space. And that was, that's basically what I wanted to tell you. Uh, first of all, I hope I convinced you that uh, metal poor massive stars are very important to, to understand and to model and to interpret past stages of the universe. At the moment, thanks to current observational facilities, we are studying how these stars evolve and uh, an important issue as the upper mass limit. But uh, uh, we are hitting the, uh, the current limits of current observational facilities. And for this reason, here at CAP, we are very much involved, uh, although only at the, at the science definition level, in short, medium, and long term programs and mission. And thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Miriam. Very, very nice talk. Uh, so we can go with the questions. Are there any questions here? The audience? Maybe I can start. Uh, thanks, Miriam, for the nice talk. I have a couple of questions. So the first one is regarding uh, this finding of these uh, metal poor massive stars in the outer parts of uh, galaxies. So I was wondering, is that a bias, an observational bias, or uh, because there's more extinction towards the innermost parts, or is just that uh, they are formed there in the outer parts of the galaxy? So can I? <laughs> I'm going to drop this. So I'm not sure if I said it, but uh, when we detected these stars, they were the most massive we knew in the galaxy, but uh, uh, the census is incomplete. We are still working on it and we are finding more massive stars in other locations. So whether it's an observational bias due to extinction of, or not, we cannot say yet until the census is complete. And obviously one thing we would like to do, but this really will have to wait for the, for the extremely large telescope is to do infrared photometry and uh, hopefully spectroscopy. And that way we will be able to, do, to gauge uh, what the role of extinction is because uh, really at the moment we, we don't know. The, the infrared observations at the moment are not deep enough uh, to reveal uh, an underlying population. So that's not the last word of it, but it's uh, remarkable that the uh, stars are, are found so far away from the center of the galaxy. And not only happens here, I, I skip this, um, this slide, but uh, okay, we, we, don't, we cannot see now, <laughs> but the same happens in, in other galaxies. There, there are UV bright sources very far in the outskirts. And at the beginning, I thought there were foreground uh, stars or background sources of some kind. And when you see the connection with the distribution of neutral atomic hydrogen, it all makes sense. So star formation is ongoing there. We don't know if it's an edge effect happening at the edge of the, of the cloud, or maybe there's embedded star formation. I can show you later. 
uh, uh, behind hydrogen, but for sure something is going on there. So can you tell something about what is the origin of this uh, star formation burst in the outer part? No. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, something that... I, I cannot say anything. Like, uh, as you know, one of our programs was to, to look uh, uh, for molecular gas in these uh, regions uh, to see if maybe there was very, very deeply embedded uh, star formation that we will not detect it. But of course, uh, looking for uh, molecular gas here is very hard because uh, of the abundance of the uh, carbon monoxide. And so we didn't get the observing time. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Tough. something we should try again, by the way. Right. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Yeah, or maybe from Zoom. Ah, there's one question here from Guillermo. Thank you. Uh, I had that actually the same question as Ithaskun because uh, the resemblance with the uh, early universe and the outskirt of the galaxy, uh, you know, for someone who doesn't know about the field, you, you might think that you have a low metallicity environment, in these regions, um, and therefore, at least, uh, well, the, the idea is that if you don't have coolants like the carbon, you need a high mass of helium and, uh, sorry, hydrogen and maybe some helium to, to grow these uh, first massive stars. But um, so, so you I are saying that perhaps they saying... are isolated because they consume the, the whole the whole cloud yeah. for themselves. Yeah. And yeah. that might explain why they don't grow in a cluster. That, that would be very interesting, yes. But uh, I, I think we are a bit far from being able to make that uh, uh, affirmation. Okay, okay. Yeah. And about the metallicity? The, the uh, other possibility, sorry, is that uh, I didn't say anything about binaries on purpose. <laughs> but the, the other possibility is that perhaps uh, uh, they could be mergers of uh, smaller mass stars. But uh, we don't we don't know yet. Uh, we need to obtain higher resolution spectra with a high signal to noise ratio, which we don't have at the moment. So we can constrain the, the stellar properties and the, and the surface abundances. So th there are many uh, possible hypotheses that could explain these stars. Uh, I think at the moment what we need to do is to survey all these uh, UV bright sources at the at the outskirts and see if uh, there is a pattern, uh, something that emerges emerges out of it but at the moment we don't know okay very interesting thank you thank you miriam can you hear us yeah there is a question in the chat from pablo maria are there any other questions there <laughs> yes there is a question from pablo pablo go ahead please hello can you hear me sí. okay I, I was going in fact to ask you about the thing that you just mentioned that on purpose, you didn't mention. <laughs> Let's start with an easier one. So for all, most of these galaxies that you show, the uh, nearby galaxies, low metallicity nearby galaxies, the metallicity estimation uh, normally it, uh, refers to the whole galaxy. And in many cases is, uh, uh, is uh, based on, on gas uh, uh, on the H2 regions. So my first question is uh, if you, have analyzed the difference between the, the metallicity of the, of the whole galaxy and the metallicity of your stars. Of course, these are young stars and maybe they, they match uh, very well, but uh, I find it interesting. And the second question was about binaries. Uh, it's, it seems that 50, 60, 80, 90% of massive stars are supposed to live with one or several companions in binaries of multiple systems. And, and uh, in multiple systems, the evolution could can be very, very different. I, I don't know if you, if we have the 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 the, the instruments to to uh, and to to study in detail the the nature, the binary nature of, of the stars that you are studying, or if we will have uh, something in the future. So I, I wanted you to tell us something about that because all the mess that you showed in the HR diagram uh, complicates uh, because maybe it is ruled by binarity. 
Okay, yeah, uh, extremely good point. <laughs> Uh, and actually, uh, binaries in these metal poor galaxies is uh, even more important uh, for two reasons. The first one is that it provides an additional, an additional mechanism of mass loss. Since the stellar winds are not very strong, uh, the star could still lose a lot of mass to a binary and the effect uh, would be enhanced. And the second reason is that in this process of mass transfer, uh, there's also a transfer of angular momentum and one of the stars are, is spun up. And it could more easily enter this channel of uh, chemically homogeneous evolution. Uh, so yes, we always have binaries in our minds, but we cannot tackle that at the moment. So because uh, so, uh, the spectra we are obtaining in sextancy, for instance, for some of the stars, we require integration times of 10 hours, and that's to obtain one single uh, final spectrum. Of course, we check for radial velocity variations, but uh, sometimes the resolution and the signal to noise ratio is so poor that we cannot say anything about it. Um, so it's very hard to plan and to and to sell to the to the tackle, to the time allocation committee a program of a uh, multi epoch program of uh, 10 hours 10 hours each epoch to to locate binaries that being said in in sextance we already have five observing runs and uh, finally uh, we are reducing marte is reducing the the last observing run and we are finally detecting some radial velocity variations with previous observations. So uh, one of the results of Marta's paper is going to be a, a, to publish the first list of binary stars in metal poor environments. And from then on, we can begin to, to, to study all, all these effects of binary evolution in metal poor massive stars. But uh, to answer shortly to your questions, we, uh, we have not been able to do anything because of the limitation of the of the current data. But but that this is a, pro, a problem that can be tackled with ELT, uh, do you think? Or sure, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, with uh, with mosaic. But we will need to wait for mosaic and let okay. well. We will be able to do it with, with harmony, but again, uh, one system at a time. A mosaic will be much more efficient. Uh, to answer the second question, uh, you are uh, absolutely right. And uh, we, when we began making this uh, list of uh, metal poor dwarf irregular galaxies, usually uh, uh, the only information we have about the present day chemical composition of the interstellar medium is what we measure from H2 regions. So, and it's not even a, an overall value for the whole galaxy, but it's a, a sample or three or five or, or whatever H2 regions studied in the galaxy at very specific locations. And the values that I've been given is the, the average of uh, that chemical composition. So what happens, what happened in IC1613, and actually, if you noticed, uh, for some galaxies, I was uh, I was using uh, this symbol, uh, meaning I was scaling oxygen to the uh, solar oxygen value, and for some other galaxies like Sextant C, I was using the C value, and this is not a mistake. This is on purpose. So in IC 1613 and the other 17 solar oxygen abundance, what happened is that eight two regions. Uh, were telling us that the oxygen content was very poor. But uh, when we obtained the ultraviolet spectra of the IC1613 stars, and uh, well, some other studies revealed something similar in WLM and NGC3109, what, uh, what we found is that the content in heavy elements, iron, nickel, and so on, was actually uh, closer to the value of the small magnetic cloud or even higher. So uh, uh, you are right, uh, it's, uh, we need to be guided by the nebular abundances of oxygen, but uh, the second part of the program is to obtain our own abundances from the spectra of the OV-type stars. But we are hitting again the same problems of uh, spectral quality and signal-to-noise ratio. 
unless uh, we get ultraviolet spectra. For, so in sextant C, we are using the, the metallicity symbol because we have ultraviolet spectra of orbit hyperstars in this galaxy. And the ultraviolet spectrum is telling us that the iron content is actually one tenth solar. So to summarize, uh, we need both evidence from the interstellar medium, but mostly we need to confirm uh, whatever abundances uh, from the stars themselves. Okay. Okay. Pablo seems happy with that answer. Very, very happy. Thank you. <laughs> and then there's one last question uh, from here. Thank you for the talk, Miriam. I have a question related to two of the mechanisms related to the evolution of this type of galaxies that I think I have understood. One of them is, well, actually, whether there is observational evidence for both of them. One of them is whether two stars can merge to form a single star. And the second is whether a star can be completely disrupted, leaving no remnant. No neutron star, no white mm -hmm. dwarf, no black hole, just completely de destroyed and spread all yeah. over the place. So what, what's the question? I'm sorry. There is evidence for both of them, observational evidence for that type of mechanism being able to uh, Yeah, because some of the supernova remnants uh, don't have a compact object in the in the center of the of the remnant. Okay, no. okay. And about the merger of two stars? The, the merger of two stars, uh, there are several evidences, especially coming from the less massive star world. But uh, 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 the evidence that is making us thinking uh, about mergers is uh, the, the HR diagram of the large magnetic cloud and the small magnetic cloud. And uh, there seems to be a gap between uh, the lower main sequence and the upper main sequence. I'm sorry, I don't have an HR diagram here. And one of the proposed explanations for that for that gap is that the stars in the upper main sequence are actually mergers. They form from the mergers of the lower mass stars. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If there are no other questions, then let's thank Miriam again. And then uh, Maria, do you want to say something? No, there are no more questions, more questions on Zoom either. So just um, thank you very much again, Miriam. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks.